so again, my name is Namira. Um, and uh, one of the questions already, this is great. <laughs> so this is a webinar, you can only see you. Yes, so you'll be seeing uh, myself and Khadar as well. Um, and we're just really excited to be able to take your questions um, through the chat, through the Q&A throughout. So, um, you know, my background, I'm a lawyer and graphic designer, uh, co-founder of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, um, and I'm based here in Michigan as well. Uh, for myself, you know, this has been a journey with uh, chronic illness and with disability for the last decade or so. Um, so I'm excited to be, you know, talking about, you know, with uh, Kodar here today about the different resources, the different kinds of support that's available, especially in the Dearborn area. So with that, I'd love to introduce uh, Kodar Farhat to, to introduce himself, and then we can get started with this conversation today. Sure, Namira, thank you so much for doing this. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I know it's Saturday. I appreciate your valuable time. Hope everybody is staying safe and healthy and doing great. I'm excited. Uh, I'm a public speaker, advocate, and activist for individuals with different abilities, as well as a public policymaker and um, advocate for equality education and uh, equality and accessibility. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan with a bachelor's in political science, and I've been an advocate for the past six, seven years. And I live in Dearborn, and uh, you know I cannot be prouder, um, you know, to belong of such supportive and encouraging community like the one that we have here in Dearborn. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this great session. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to the uh, MDRC and uh, to Omer and to you, Namira, for taking your time as well. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm really excited uh, to get into this conversation. So before we kind of talk about some of the organizations, I would love to hear from you, you know, some insights some numbers about disabled uh, communities in the area. Absolutely. So um, just want to clarify a um, couple of things, because nowadays disability is no longer specified by the physical or visible disability. Uh, nowadays, disability does vary. Um, you know, from mental, emotional, social, psychological, and physical. Having said that, this means that we do have visible and invisible disabilities. Just want to clarify this. So when the audience, uh, you know, once they, you know, listen to the organization that we have, uh, just so they can tell the, the diversity of these organizations and their goals and targets and their audiences so they understand. So it's no longer just being blind. Uh, I mean, which I'm blind too, by the way. Sorry, I did not. I forgot to mention that I'm blind since birth. So not that being blind only is considered disabled today. We have so many things that are uh, entitled or qualified to be, you know, under the Disability uh, Act, ADA, American with Disabilities Act. So uh, just let me start from a state level, then county level, then Dearborn level. Um, now today we're talking about the Dearborn organizations, right? Like the resources that we have here in Dearborn, but we cannot. Uh, separate the local, county, and the state levels, um, agencies and organizations for many reasons. We're going to get into that in a minute. So in Dearborn, Namira, and our, and our beloved audience, we have well over 1.5 million challenged individual or Michigan residents statewide. Having said that, 1.5, over 1.5 million, some people say 1.7 million, some people say 1.9 million, but close to 2 million, which means close to, close to 20% of the state population have a certain challenge or disability uh, that is a commonly known uh, and used term. Um, you know, and then go to Wayne County. Dearborn is in Wayne County and Wayne County has 16% of that. So we're talking almost 183,000 Wayne County residents that have disability or are qualified or labeled as disabled or differently abled. I love to use a word challenge, so I'm sorry for the confusion, but some people, they use disability, some people use differently able. Um, having said that, we need to take care of, um, of, of the secret population. This population has so many talented and highly qualified individuals, professionals, engineers, teachers, educators, politicians, uh, business people, engineers, I mean, you name it. Um, so to ensure that they are participating to the max, in the society, whether getting married, uh, opening up businesses, families, uh, you know, whatever, purchasing houses, just living as normal as possible, because at the end, we have to normalize, uh, you know, this concept, and they should feel welcome and wanted and needed. Um, so these are some numbers. Now, we don't have specific numbers 
pertaining to uh, each disability. However, I can tell you that the blind population is the least amongst um, you know this group. So just to point that something, uh, Namira, that the disabled yeah. population is the largest minority group in the USA. So just, I mean, let me just make sure, I mean, just so people can know. Um, so we don't have like specific like numbers that are broken down, like, you know, per disability, but uh, mental health and the cognitive, uh, you know, uh, impairment uh, is uh, growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and they need a lot of help to feel that, you know, that they are integrated um, in the society, like when it comes to employment, when it comes to uh, care and, and, and everything in between, especially now in the midst of the pandemic. And this added really a huge uh, burden, not only actually on the differently able population and their caregivers and uh, employers and everything, but also even on the average person uh, nowadays. So this is just, I just wanted to provide this, uh, you know, overall image just to give people how important such topic is on the state level and the county level here link and in Dearborn. Uh, in Dearborn, we have a huge senior population as well. Um, and we have major organizations also that are really, you know, that these were found and uh, still thrive in the city of Dearborn. And uh, we welcome any question or any clarification. And if we don't mention anything, you know, throughout the session today, due to time constraint, you know, we will be all, I'll be more than happy to follow up uh, with regards to anything. But please don't be shy. You know, ask your questions, whether you and Amira or, or our audience, and uh, I'll be more than happy to follow up if I don't have like on the spot answer for, for you know, to, to any question. Yeah, thanks, Heather. This is really helpful. Um, you know, we have a question already that's like, do you help sure. people who are disabled in Lansing? And so one thing that, you know, from looking at the, the organizations we'll be talking about is that we're yeah. going to be talking about Dearborn specific and statewide um, yes. organizations. Exactly, because we cannot separate them because um, so many resources come from the state level and so many resources come from the federal level and then so many come down to the local level. So obviously, if I live in Dearborn, I should be reaching out to Dearborn local organizations or neighboring, uh, you know, like uh, like a nearby organization. But if I don't find uh, anything, and even if I do find anything, and this is what I encourage parents, caregivers, individuals, you know, if they reach out to any organization nearby where they live, and they couldn't get the quality help that they were expecting, I kindly ask them to reach out to the state level because um, again, under law, everybody should be accommodated and all accommodation should be provided accordingly. So yes, we'll be talking about Dearborn organizations um, and then uh, county organizations, which they all kind of like, they kind of build a bridge, you know, I mean, between the local county and the state level and they're all like overlap in many ways which we, would, which we will be talking about. Yeah, I wanted to uplift, you know, something that you mentioned around that 20% number. I mean, that's significant, right? Like one in five Absolutely. people. Um, and just <clears throat> providing that framework as well. We had, you know, a beautiful conversation around like disability in Muslim communities, um, oh gosh, a month ago at this point. But uh, yeah. one point that had come out around that was around the fact that like, we want a society that is, is accessible for all people, right? Sure. Regardless of their backgrounds. And Absolutely. thinking about the, the role and the context for some of this support, it's like, we should have a world where every single person finds services yes. and employment is accessible. Yes, and and again, this is especially true to our uh, mentally challenged uh, individuals, uh, you know, with autism, cognitive, uh, you know, impaired, um, because they have even more difficult time uh, to integrate and, uh, you know, especially all these restrictions. Now, Michigan is one of the very, very few states in the entire nation that welcomes uh, autistic individuals, uh, like students that say up until age 26. You cannot believe how many families move out of Florida or California even to live here in, in Michigan uh, just because, you know, their loved one, their son, their daughter, their cousin, sibling, you know, uh, whoever may be, uh, you know, because they'll be qualified to stay in our programs here in the state up until age 26. So what we wanna make sure is as advocates, um, as uh, great fighters like yourself and all these great organizations is to make sure that we are preparing these individuals to live independently, sufficiently, adequately, as much as possible. And that's, especially when it comes to finding a good 
quality jobs for them, a competitive employment opportunities, just like everybody else. You know, we're not asking for special privileges. I always say that we're not asking for any special passes either. We're looking at talented individuals that meet the that meet the qualifications, and they apply for a job, and then they will be accommodated. Which is we made a we came a long way in that regards. Uh, we can also touch touch on that uh, as we go in the session. But yeah, yeah, to your point, it's very important to be inclusive and uh, friendly. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's really important to think about you know the fact of how are we ensuring that every single person has has accessibility. Sure. Okay, great. So let's dive right in to thinking about you know some of the disability resources in Dearborn in particular. So I'm going to go ahead uh, again, you know, encouraging people who are tuning in to use the Q and A, to use the chat if you have specific questions that are coming up. Um, I'm going to be kind of asking Heather about various organizations that are in Dearborn, you know, what kind of services they offer, just a little bit about them to give you all an overview. But if you have other questions, please do feel free to put that in the chat. Um, I'll be checking that pretty regularly. Okay, so first up, um, why don't we talk about access? Sure. Um, so access is uh, one of the most valuable organizations, um, actually, not only in Dearborn, but also Southeast Michigan. Um, access uh, was founded uh, decades ago, and they offer a lot of social um, and, you know, like health related services. And among their services, they do offer a program, uh, you know, that houses individuals with autism and they help them like to live independently and uh, like how to basically like manage their daily operations and activities. Now, again, that's only one side. They have a clinic, they have a social services uh, department, they have uh, legal advice as well. You know, people that wanna apply for welfare, food stamps, you know, social security and all that, and all the stuff in between. So access, when we talk about organizations statewide, uh, could be amongst even the Middle Eastern population or the minority population. Obviously, access should not and cannot be avoided or, or overlooked because it did and it does still serve a lot of people every single day and regardless of their background, as you were talking about a minute ago. So it was founded in Dearborn. Yes, it mainly serves Dearborn because that's where it's located and the neighboring cities. But obviously, they do serve and accommodate a lot of people. So. Whoever lives in Dearborn, although I know somebody that lives in Dearborn and they have an autistic or cognitively challenged individual, um, I don't know like the exact qualifications now with the COVID and uh, the restrictions. I, I assume they are doing everything virtual, obviously, just like how we're doing this now and how pretty much everything is, is, is being done and transferred nowadays to virtual environment. Um, but if they would like to know more info about it, please reach out to me and I can provide the phone number. Um, that is 313-945-8167. Again, that is 313-945-8167. And again, they can ask about that. Uh, we have a lot of changes going on, you know, um, I mean, now, especially with COVID, but even pre-COVID, like before COVID, I mean, you know, a change always were made. So that's a very valuable uh, organization right there. I mean, it covers the whole nine yards the social aspect. They have a lot of seminars, a lot of workshops, um, and I think it's very, very essential. Mm -hmm. And I put that number in the chat as well. So again, 313-945-8167. Um, the website is accesscommunity.org. So yes. I'll also drop that in the chat as well. Okay, sure. great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next up, Arab Americans and Chaldean Council, so ACC. Sure. Um, that's another great resource, and that builds a bridge. Um, amongst different minority groups. Um, and they do also have um, the Chaldean Foundation as well. And the Chaldean Foundation based off Sterling Heights in Michigan, um, they also have uh, a great, um, you know, activities and they have a program that personally, as a blind person myself, I went and I visited them uh, at least a couple of times back, a couple of years back. Um, you know, and they do a lot of stuff like, you know, teaching Braille, you know, the dotted language for the blind, uh, mobility, you know, technology, assistive uh, technology, you know, independent living and all that stuff. And this is a great opportunity, not only for individuals with disabilities, but also uh, to get to know different cultures, different food. And it's awesome. I, I mean, when I went there, I mean, I used to spend pretty much the whole day, like four or five hours. And uh, the good thing about that spirit that the vast majority of the program attendees and participants 
are newly blind. You know, like they were not born blind. They uh, became blind either due to a medical condition, um, you know, or uh, any other matter. And then, you know, they are just learning how to adapt to this new life, which is very hectic um, and very challenging. Uh, yet the rewards that come with it are very much as well. So um, that's another uh, great resource. And their phone number uh, also is 313-581. 7287 again 313-581-7287 and today speaking of cultures and diversity we are in the utmost need for love kindness unity it doesn't matter how you look how you sound what kind of socioeconomic status you belong to um, what kind of ability you have and because we are all unique in our own ways and we are we are, i mean we need, we need one another so that's the beauty of this particular council and what they offer. Yeah, uh, that's really helpful. And I love the kind of personal anecdote too about, you know, spending the day with them. That's really great. And I think yeah. especially when we hear some of these narratives too about like, oh, you know, these two communities, they don't get along or they don't blah, blah, exactly. right? We think about conflict a lot and then you have organizations like this that are providing sure. clear differences. So great. Yes, I mean, um, that's very different. Yeah. That's absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really important. And I think it, it just goes to show like sometimes what's happening on the ground is so different than what people are talking about sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you know, we need, we need always to encourage efforts like that. I mean, love and unity and building bridges won't happen alone like that. You know, I mean, we need individuals that uh, encourage that. We need actions to pave the way. And uh, yes, I mean, nothing like it, trust me. So the next one, services to enhance potential. I'm really curious Absolutely. about this organization. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You love its name, right? Services. Yeah, the, just the name itself is painting such a vision, right? Services to enhance Absolutely. potential. Absolutely. They have, they have <laughs> actually three different locations throughout Wayne County, and they have one in Dearborn, one in Wayne, and one in Westland, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure about Dearborn and Westland. I, I think, yeah, the third is in Wayne or Detroit, um, one of these two. Um, but the services to enhance potential, every year I try to sponsor um, a kid. Um, or an attendee or a participant um, or an individual of their uh, programs. And, you know, let's say last year, I believe it was uh, somebody that, that loves wrestling. So I was extremely thrilled to sponsor, um, you know, that individual with uh, another person of his choice to accompany him to watch WWE. Um, and they were not only attending, but also they were seated at the front row with a VIP experience. So, I mean, wow. such, I mean, such thing, I'm not really dropping it just to, you know, talk about what I do, God forbid, you know, I'm just talking about stuff like that because we all can make a difference. Um, so that kid loves wrestling, like what I do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and he was super excited, uh, you know, to attend a wrestling event alone. So let alone that. So when he found out that he's going to be sitting a very front row, uh, in front of the cameras and was live televised on USA Network. And uh, it was extremely like exciting for him. So they serve individuals that are mentally challenged. They help them to, uh, you know, integrate. You're going to hear me say the word integrate a lot because all these organizations locally and statewide, they all work hard day in and day out to encourage for inclusive, I'm sorry, for inclusion and uh, fair share uh, opportunities, you know, to all their clients. So the service and potential, they, I, I go and I speak uh, at their events. I spoke last time twice. I met with their parents groups. I spoke there the previous year. And so I always love to have that personal touch on things because when you are in, like personally, uh, you know, uh, attached to the organization and you see firsthand their hard work and the fruits, as we say, of their hard work, you know, you are going to be even more encouraged and, uh, and, and give me more like push to do even more stuff with them. So they do an amazing job. They help students and individuals to, you know, become more productive, more independent. And they also provide them jobs. Now in the midst of the pandemic, unfortunately they lost uh, a lot of job opportunities. Just a lot of people did because a lot of their clients used to work like at a hospital, um, hotel or like a workshop or like a store or restaurant and now with the COVID cases increasing and the restrictions, they lost a lot of that. 
but they are very valuable and I kindly ask everybody to check them out um, and support them if they can. And their phone number is uh, 313-278-3040. Once again, services to enhance potential, Dearborn Branch, 313-278-3040. And their staff is very, their staff members are very encouraging, very supportive, very professional, and uh, they really hold the best interest of their, in, of their participants at their like highest regards. And that's very important when it comes to these services. Not only that we need these services to be provided and offered, but also we need to make sure that the staff that are offering them are doing it from the bottom of their heart and they are so passionate about. And then also we expect from parents or caregivers uh, to give it a shot and try hard so we can even see better results and outcomes. Great point around um, engagement, right? And the level of support. It's like some of these organizations, these are created, you know, bias for us kind of sure. mindset. And so how are we engaging? How are we supporting? How are we holding each other in community, especially for thinking about improvements and other things as well? Um, so one of the things that came up in the chat was around, you know, the name of the resources whenever we're talking about them. So I am pasting like the name of the organization and the phone number in there. But one thing that MRDC can do is to actually uh, offer to send you the list. So if you want, you can put your, um, you can contact uh, Omar, who's in the in the chat, uh, to just give us your email address, and we can send out this list as well, so you have them all in one place. But you know, if there's specific organizations, as Claire is talking about it, I am putting the name of the organization and the phone number in the chat as well. Appreciate you doing so, that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have your email address is actually on file. So just let us know if you do want the list. Um, we can we can send that your way. Sure. Services to enhance potential. I guess the other question that I had as you were talking about them, can people kind of sign up to have their like family member or somebody be one of the people who receive kind of that sponsorship? With yeah, leadership? so 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 that's that's what we want to talk about um, as we're going through this. So that's why I mentioned in the beginning for a reason, the different disabilities, um, you know, so it depends on the disability um, and the qualifications and like what a medical report may show. Uh, but yeah, certainly, like let's say a service student has potential, for example, I mean, uh, you know, I wish if I if I have like a definitive answer, um, I don't, uh, but certainly call them up and ask, uh, you know, and, and, and see, and if I can be of any assistance in that regards, I would love to facilitate, uh, you know, that process. But yeah, you have to call to double check um, and see what's going on. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they're gonna be able to guide you and that's why today I brought some statewide organization because we'll talk about it in a minute, but that's why I brought the statewide because sometimes you have to go through them first and foremost. So um, yeah, but call them and, and ask. And again, I'll be more than happy to follow up or facilitate. I almost know an executive person at each of these organization, almost. So, <laughs> that makes sense, that makes sense. Community is like, it's big, but it's not that big, right? So we can, I mean, we can definitely I mean, know somebody I mean, who knows involved. somebody, right? I mean, I mean, because I mean, I mean, I've been involved and, and I can make things better. And, and even if you don't know anybody at these places, I mean, you can simply call and inquire. I mean, I'm pretty sure that they're going to be welcoming because, again, their passion and their heart are both in the right place. So, um, and I've been involved with them, like with a lot of them in person, virtually, uh, donation wise uh, get get the word out to public policy wise you know since like 2013 so that's why i'm not new to that but you know yeah I, I would love to help seriously because i know these are very valuable absolutely absolutely um so the next step that i wanted to ask you about was arc dearborn yes arc dearborn is another great resource for the mentally challenged individuals and again and again i'm not gonna get sick and tired of repeating these phrases, you know, uh, encouraging for inclusion, fair and competitive uh, and equal job opportunities and independent living. ARC Dearborn, they are obviously everywhere, even in Detroit and I, uh, and I did speak at their events uh, also many times in the past few years, um, you know, and they offer great services as well. Uh, so that's why I want to, you know, make sure that uh, our audience uh, is aware of one thing that, again, each disability is unique. Some people, they have, they might have more than one disability, like two or three, for example, like being blind, autistic, I'm saying, for example, and ADHD, 
because we do have you know these combinations going on and going around. So in such circumstances, different when somebody is only blind or is only uh, you know autistic. So uh, that's why each organization is a bit unique. And uh, but their goal, their end goal, is to make sure that their clients are as inclusive and engaged and respected and living with integrity as much as possible. So their phone number is in Dearborn branch, 313-562-1787. Again, that is 313-562-1787. And again, they have different branches. I know the one here in Dearborn and as well as the one in Detroit, um, but I'm pretty sure they might have some other stuff uh, statewide. And again, if they don't like serve you directly, I'm pretty sure that they'll be able to uh, you know, guide you. But I think the list that we compiled today, I believe it should cover pretty much the entire state, um, you know, and it should be, uh, you know, I mean, really a great, a great source for, for people that are looking. Because seeing the mirror, we have to highlight one thing. Mm -hmm. As much as these organizations are out there and doing such a great job, a lot of people still do not know about them much. They right. don't know, much, you know, like where to go, who, who to ask. So that's why, that's why I keep repeating let me know if I can be of any assistance or reach out to you and Amir or to, or to Omar or, you know, I mean, to anybody because a lot of people, they don't even know. And then you're going to be surprised at the upcoming two. <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why I mentioned them. You know, that's why I, I mentioned the, the upcoming two resources. And, and you'll be surprised. A lot of people do not even know that they do exist. And if so, what kind of services they offer. So please reach out to the Art Dearborn if you live in Dearborn. If not, uh, look them up. Uh, in your area. And if not, I'd be more than happy to help you to facilitate that. So again, that's 313-562-1787. It's such a great point around like the knowledge around some of these and the awareness around some of these organizations. Because if you think about some of the corporations that people know their branding and their website and all of that, it's like, think about the millions of dollars that go into yeah. that aspect of like the brand awareness piece, which some of these organizations, it's like, you know, they're working with limited staff, limited budget. And so we have to do our part to make sure we spread the word. About well, we have to do our part in two ways. Number one, um, that's why our first, my first commercial that I did was mm -hmm. about a service called My Able Account. And My Able Account is basically allows individuals with, with different abilities to save money in their bank accounts without them being taxed. Meaning if you're in a wheelchair and you want to build a ramp, that's not going to cost you a couple of thousand dollars. It's going to cost you, uh, who knows, 10, 15, 20, 25,000, right. right? So you can save money in a My Able account. And, you know, I mean, I didn't know about it myself. But now that I knew about it since two years, we have been pushing so badly that we can make it, you know, approved in every single state. So now I think we're at 43 out of 50. Wow. You know? Um, I'm not saying that these 43 were approved in the last two years. I'm just saying that at least five or six states were approved in the past two years. And I did the conversion. I am blind. And we need people that represents disability to do that stuff, whether in a wheelchair, whether ADHD, whether autism, whether blind, whether deaf and blind, whether just deaf, um, you know, cerebral palsy, whatever the case is. We need to encourage that participation so we can uh, spread awareness and, you know, display the real and true meaning of motivation. You know, as uh, we said in our previous event with you guys, we said that, you know, motivation means when you overcome an obstacle, but in a way that you truly demonstrated tenacity and perseverance. Because I don't want people telling me, oh, you're eating by yourself, oh, that's motivation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, right. I appreciate that. And obviously eating while you're able to see is way more enjoyable, I guess, and, you know, but, <laughs> Trust me, I eat very well. That's a bit of an example, and I don't mess around as well. Like I don't have a, I don't, I don't, I don't make a big mess like a lot of sighted people do. Believe it or not, <laughs> you know. So yeah, so so when we talk about motivation, I mean, you know, like really like overcoming obstacles and living beyond the normal life. Just wanted to to point that out. So yeah, it's a great point, and I think that comes up so many. There's so many layers to this because you mentioned earlier too, like that layered um, aspect of multiple disabilities um, across yeah. different aspects. Yeah. Um, and so that's so important to think about because sometimes it's like just for existing, there's this inspiration, <laughs> you know, um, the way people call it sometimes inspiration porn, right? That's what it I mean, just comes. It's a very strange dynamic around that. Exactly. So it's, it's very important from our end as disabled people to educate and spread, our, spread, spread around the accurate 
information and for those organizations also to always be visible and let's help them to be more visible. And that's why I'll be talking about the future at the very end because that's gonna be the most exciting part. And I think um, I personally, because I only can talk about myself, I think I did pave the way uh, in this very past election uh, in Dearborn. And I think uh, the best is yet to come in the near future. So uh, we'll talk about that, not my future, but the future of the uh, disabled community in Dearborn and the state of Michigan uh, as a whole. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, because that's where our focus now should be. It's no longer about only advocating, publicly speaking and educating and, uh, and, and, and motivating. It's, it's also now about public policy and about being in the game rather than just watching the game. Absolutely, and I'm really excited for those who don't know how they ran for, um, I believe, the school board, correct? Yeah. Your board? Yep. Your board, your board school board, and I, and yeah. I want to thank every, every single voter that, uh, you know, trust, that is entrusted me with their votes and respect and trust. I've earned uh, 12,263 votes, and I lost by 15 votes only, so we did request a recount just because I want to honor I want to make sure that I'm honoring, you know, uh, the voters' trust and, and 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 support. So, nothing against anybody, nothing personal, nothing uh, about an ego or what have you. But we have to honor uh, the people that voted, and regardless of any title or position, we're going to remain here to advocate and fight for what is right and moral and ethical. Absolutely, so, and I think that's I didn't mean to, to cut you off. By the way, I'm sorry. I just, oh, you're okay. I'm, you're okay. I'm, I'm, you're all good. Very, Sorry. <laughs> we're having a conversation so that yeah. happened absolutely yeah no and i wanted to mention that because it's so important as we're thinking about all these dimensions to the work like look at where people can support right people can run for office people can exactly. run um for all these different levels of government too and get involved in the public sure. policy piece and you have to be in the game to change the game exactly I mean, so yeah i mean i mean you can't score a goal in a soccer game if you're just sitting uh, on the sideline right so same thing nowadays. Nowadays, it's all, it's all about public policy and about spreading awareness. And I encourage you to run for office. I think you'll make a great candidate. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I think there's so many different models for social change, right? As a lawyer, yeah. and especially somebody who works in the anti-racism field, public policy I mean, is I mean, such I mean, a I mean, you got a legal, I mean, you got, a, you got an extensive legal uh, expertise and knowledge and that's what we need nowadays. We need, we need lawyers to fight to, uh, for what is it right? What is it equal, ethical, moral? and not just uh, those that are thirsty for power Absolutely. you know and that's Absolutely. yeah so so i i challenge you to <laughs> really consider this you know and um, and and i've been more than happy to support in every way shape and form that i can i appreciate that i appreciate that so much and i want to you know put that out to everybody who's tuning in as well right like thinking about doing something that might be pushing the boundaries a little bit or something that you might not have considered doing earlier, but to get involved in different ways um, with some of the social change that's needed. Great. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so let me go ahead and then we have a few more that are Dearborn specific, and then we're going to switch sure. to the team at statewide. Oh, yeah. Agencies. So yeah, we just talked about ARC Dearborn. Um, the next one is the Dearborn Special Needs 911 Registry. Yeah, I love that one. So this is part of our obviously 911 attached to our police department, which big shout out to all of our men and women in blue, uh, nationwide and especially here in Dearborn. Uh, our chief, Chief Haddad, is an amazing, humble, accessible chief that is doing his best alongside all, uh, all of our men and women in the department to protect us, especially in such time where make sure that you know all these restrictions are being followed and everybody's being safe and secure so we can enjoy the best life that we can. Um, so they created the special needs 911 registry. Basically, let's say if they received a call and uh, something was going on. Um, so the registry, obviously, you have to reach out and say, "Hey, my my brother is blind," or "Hey, my sister is autistic," or "My dad is deaf," or whatever the case is. So once they have that in their system, and if the, if, if God forbid, if you happen to have an emergency, and you call. So the police officers are going to be aware of, of, of what's going on in advance. So once they see that, oh, there's a blind guy in the house or, you know, uh, let's say a cognitively challenged uh, individual in the house, they will know how to, um, you know, deal with the entire situation. So they will understand what's going on. They'll be ready. And instead of because, you know, we've heard about many stories of police officers just beating up. Uh, I mean, I'm very sorry to, I mean, to use this term because that was not what happened. That's very unfortunate. But we have heard many stories uh, and we hear it every day 
you know, of, of officers beating up, let's say, an autistic uh, individual or somebody with mental health issues, and they didn't know it. You know, I mean, so that's why the purpose of this of this registry is to make sure that whoever has a special needs um, individual or household member to let the police uh, department know. So in case something happens, and when they come over to the house, they will be aware and prepared so they can, you know, uh, understand and, and, and be ready to how to operate and cooperate with this situation. Thanks for so, yeah sharing a little bit more about that, because that has absolutely been, you know, nationwide, so many, so many stories around um, you know, somebody who's deaf and the police are shouting commands at them, but they're deaf. They can't yeah. understand what the commands are. So then, you know, resulting yeah. in bodily harm and death. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. So, so, so I think that's very valuable. And uh, I encourage all police departments uh, around the state and the nation and the world to do some, something like that. I mean, you know, that, 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 that's very important. That's going to increase safety and awareness. And, uh, and, and, and they go through, they go through a lot of training, by the way. And I always make sure that you know, that happens, not because I wanted that to see, not because I want to see that happening, but because that's very important. Uh, so we can, you know, increase awareness and sensitivity training. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So the next one, University of Michigan Dearborn, they have some disability services. So can you share a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to combine the last two, uh, sure. the U of M, uh, the University of Michigan Dearborn, go blue. I'm a go blue. With all the respect, <laughs> undergrad, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just kidding. We love, we love Michigan State. Um, I went to Michigan State for law school, so yeah, I am oh, actually. Oh, State, so we have there to. We yeah. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you're gonna block me off this. Uh, so I have to uh, <laughs> behave. <laughs> so basically, both uh, University of Michigan Dearborn, because you know U of M has three different campuses. The one in Dearborn, they have a disability office, disability services office. Same, same thing with the Henry Ford College as well. Which is which they happen to be door by door, I mean next to each other, um, so side by side. So University of Michigan, dear, if you are a student at the University of Michigan, if you know somebody who is a student at the University of Michigan, and quite frankly at any college, but since we're talking about Dearborn, you know, um, so the University of Michigan Dearborn has a disability office that you have to bring um, either your IEP, meaning the Individualized Education Plan. Um, if you are a high schooler just coming like out of high school, going there as a freshman, or just like a doctor report that provides, um, you know, some information um, and diagnosis about uh, your situation, whether blind, cerebral palsy, deaf, deaf, blind, uh, cognitively disabled, mentally challenged, or whatever the case is. Um, so once you provide that proof and upon, you know, your admission to the university, so basically you have to get admitted to the university. So you can't, so you have to be in their, in their system. And then once you do that, if you, uh, it's getting better, uh, just so the disability service office will be notified um, of you, even if you don't want their services, even if you might not use need it much, but I encourage you to check it out, um, especially our challenge students, because it's gonna be a great help if you need extra time on things, if you need some accommodations, if a professor is not accommodating, um, if something is going on so they can, you know, uh, help, um, and same thing with Henry Ford College. They provide like scanning books now with technology. I mean, obviously we're, we no longer scan books. Uh, everything is everything is electronic and digital. Uh, but again, if you want like any extra accommodations uh, to communicate with the administration. Now, what I did is uh, just to provide a different insight. So I didn't really like the fact that the office was not much well known. Um, and that's that's why I mentioned earlier that people do not know about this stuff, not even on a campus. Like you cannot imagine how many students think, oh, really? Does that exist? I said, yes, it does. We only know about the cafeteria and the bookstore <laughs> as, as students, right? Like you go to the library uh, to study or do a research, bookstore to purchase your books, and the cafeteria to eat and chill. Um, but yeah, I told them, yes, they do exist and they do accommodate obviously certain population of the students or a student population, you know I mean? Depending on your, on your situation. Um, but what I, what I did is um, when I was a student at Henry Ford um, College and then after that University of Michigan Dearborn, um, I made sure that the administration is well aware of the office, not only that, but also of the needs of the office. Like this office doesn't only need budget and staff and you know the equipments that they need to use to accommodate they also need to be part of the decision making process so let's say just one little example 
when they were doing like a, like a search for a new chancellor at the University of Michigan, uh, Dearborn, or let's say a new president at the Henry Ford College campus, I made sure that the disability office staff and even a few disabled students that they expressed interest in participating, they met with the uh, new chancellor slash new president uh, search committee, and then they expressed their concerns and thoughts and their expectations of the new person coming in. So Critical. that's really, yeah, very that's important. really, I'm sorry. That's very important. Very oh, important. thank you. So, so that's really how we can help this office. Um, not only by, 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 by holding events, especially October Disability Awareness Month, um, you know, but also we wanna make sure that the administration is always, is up to date with the challenges, accomplishments, barriers, plans, uh, needs, what have you. We have to remain vocal as individuals in our very individual cities, households, neighborhoods, churches, mosques, temples, clubs, uh, gyms, well, not, not, not while you're lifting weights, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, we have to be vocal. So that's why I made sure that um, the um, executive office, because the president of the Henry Ford College and the chancellor are like the executive cabinet, you know, they, they run the entire campus and, uh, you know, everybody works for them and they report for them. So I made sure that, you know, U of M is approved to a multi-million dollar project. Uh, to update a lot of the braille signage and the walkways and everything in between. That's why I was honored to be selected as the difference maker and the, the difference maker of the year as well. Um, and, then, and, and an advocacy and disability champion. Um, and then same thing um, at Henry Ford. So I was able to so see, do you know who are my best buddies on these two campuses, by the way? Who? The Department of Maintenance, because every time <laughs> I saw something, I used right. to go there in person or call him, hey, Mr. Uh, X. Uh, the ADA door is not working in building A. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't do that. I said, guys, right. I, I said, I told him, guys, I can use the regular door. I mean, I don't need to use the ADA door, the one that opens up by itself automatically, right. but right. somebody else might need it. So even if I don't need something, doesn't mean that I should just forget about it and, and overlook it. You know my point? So the, the, the maintenance department was one of my, but and then the, and then the chancellor office and the president office um, at both campuses were also another buddy of mine because quite frankly, I knew them both at that time. Now they are both new and I, st I hold a good connection with both of them still. But when I was a student, I knew them before I even became a student because I was heavily involved in our community and I met them like throughout different community functions. So they know who I am, they know everything and I knew like, what does it take? So, so I used to go straight up to them and uh, that's how we made things happen. So I encourage everybody to speak up. Speak up not only by presenting the issues and the barriers, but also try to provide some solutions because we cannot expect everybody to understand and to be aware of, of what, what's going on. And as a blind person, I didn't only worry about braille signage, walkways and all that. I worried about ramps for wheelchair users, the shuttle buses to have lift, um, you know, to have sign interpreters, sign language interpreters, uh, you know, and everything in between. So. That's how we get it done. That's how we get the whole package, as we say. Yes, and that, that says so much around um, kind of solidarity around some of these issues, right? Because you're right, like if the maintenance department has not been informed that something is broken, they need to go fix it. And ideally, in an ideal world, all these things would be happening automatically, but I love that example because it's so important to think about the other aspects that, you know, we ourselves maybe don't need this specific um, tool, but somebody else will. And so why not make sure to reach out and, and provide that kind of information? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So that's really um, important. We did have absolutely. a question that just came in too that I sure. wanted to ask, and this might sure. tie into the next part where we're gonna talk about statewide agencies. Um, but somebody did ask this question around, is there a citizenship requirement to receive these services from these organizations? So a lot of them, you have to be um, either, um, actually almost all of them, I, I believe all of them, they have to be a green card, um, you know, holder, meaning like a permanent resident or a US citizen. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I mean, unless you are an international student and you go to University of Michigan and Henry Ford and uh, you need that disability service on the campus, yes, uh, even if you're in like a student visa, you can still access that. But for the most, but for the rest, pretty much, yes, you need uh, to be a green card holder um, or um, a U.S. citizen. And, um, you know, um, and, and again, as I mentioned, access helps illegal. I know a lot of lawyers, a lot of blind lawyers, a lot of 
uh, uh, you know, like uh, mildly uh, autistic lawyers. I know even non-disabled lawyers <laughs> that can help with that. I'm making sure to say these, to let people know that, yeah, there are blind lawyers. Yeah, we have exactly. blind justices. We have blind justices. We have blind mechanics. I've, I've met a blind mechanic over in Alabama right before the pandemic hits. I went in Alabama and, uh, you know, he memorizes a car just like how he memorizes like everything around him. Uh, we have a lot of great lawyers like herself, Namira, and, 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 and a lot of other like civil engineers. So that's why I'm mentioning these, not because I'm surprised, but to let people know that, yes, uh, we have a lot of great uh, professionals. Thanks. And I think with that too, uh, another great thing with something like this, I'm really glad to, to be on this session because I think it goes over, you know, services that are available, services that maybe need to be created as well. So yeah, the citizenship requirement, if somebody is um, undocumented, for example, and needs services, um, I think that'll be something that if you get it through comments, the highest level. Sorry? So if somebody is undocumented, they can yeah. receive up until 12th grade. Okay, uh, so that's good to know. After that, yeah, but after that, I mean, they, and this is not only for disability. I mean, this is pretty much right. like anything else. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I know of. I mean, I don't know anybody that went through that process, to be honest with you. Um, but that's what I hear. I hear that, you know, you can stay K through 12, just like, just like everybody else. Um, but then, uh, you know, like you can't, you know, I mean, access all that like college. And I'm not sure if you can go to college unless you have like a student kind of like a permission, like a, like a permit to work or to study or something like that. So I'm not sure about the nitty gritty legal stuff. You, you're better at that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was going to say that based on this, right, there's um, that need for that intersectionality of the approach, right, because all of these things are tied. We talked about Dearborn and, you know, language support. I know so many of these organizations have, you know, languages other than English where somebody can talk to you sure. um, and interact with you in a different language. And so thinking about that aspect of, you know, citizenship and, and undocumented status as well. Um, that these are all just areas where all these identities are, are layered on each other. So thank you for that question. I appreciate the Absolutely. We thank you for the questions. Yes. Yes. That's very so important. So let's move to thinking about some of these, you know, statewide agencies sure. um, before we kind of wrap up. And again, you know, we're a little bit past the halfway mark right now. So if people do have questions, um, additional kind of things, the comments that are coming up for you, please feel free to put that in the chat or in the Q&A and I'm gonna bring them in. Or any insight or any idea, any thought, yeah. any other resource, any um, any organization, advocates. I mean, I mean, we need every every uh, every help that we can get so we can, you know, uh, you know, get it over to the people who need it. Not everybody is gonna be in need for these organizations. And, uh, but doesn't mean that if I don't need something, doesn't mean that everybody else are the same. So that's why we wanna make sure that you know, uh, we uh, we inform our beloved ones, um, you know, about these resources, our friends, our neighbors, what have you. So important, so important. So let's talk about some of the statewide agencies. Um, first of all, the Michigan Alliance for Families. Yeah, so Michigan Alliance for Families, um, obviously they do help by providing advocates. Um, I worked with them uh, in many instances here in the public school system um, where many parents were assigned an advocate um, you know, like to advocate on behalf of their uh, child. Um, let's say if somebody with a, a disability that he or she is not, you know, being accommodated properly. You know, let's say you're blind and you're not provided, mm -hmm. you know, with the technology needed. Uh, you're, you need large print, for example, if you're low vision, if you're autistic, if you're in a wheelchair, well, any other challenge that you think that you're not being treated equally or, um, you know, you're not having equity um, you know, access to equity, equitable opportunities, you know, they make a lot of for families um, help in that. Now, um, I did not provide for a number for these because technically you can get them right away, to be honest with you. But again, if anybody is like, str like struggled to find their numbers, um, I'm more than happy to, to, send, to send that over. So that's the primary, um, you know, task for the Michigan Alliance for Families. They make sure that they are a strong alliance and they want again the same goal inclusion diversity and equity great uh next up the michigan behavioral health and developmental disability administration awesome so uh this is a combination of mental health and behavioral health and as you, as you said a minute ago that we have uh sometime a very complex cases where we have multiple disabilities um so this administration is, is agency rather works 
uh, around these issues and ensuring that they are spreading awareness and educating schools, businesses, the community at large on issues like that. So again, um, the end goal is inclusion, diversity, and equity. So that's, again, these are the three golden words um, or, or terms that we are gonna be, that we have been using uh, throughout the past 15 minutes or so, and then we're gonna, that we're gonna remain using for the rest of the session. And uh, that's, these three terms should be the, the, the bedrock of, um, you know, public policy because we want to make sure that regardless, even if you don't have a disability, um, you know, there got to be something that, you know, you struggle with. So we want to make sure that everybody's being accommodated. Yes, absolutely. Um, the Michigan Rehabilitation Services. Awesome. So this is what's so known as MRS, Michigan Rehabilitation Services. So let's say that uh, I am blind, which I am, and uh, we, will, we will be talking about the Blind Specialized Agency uh, in a minute. Let's say that your agency does not provide you with everything you need. So here where MRS steps in and they provide you with, let's say I'm working and my employer provided me with a computer but they cannot provide me with, a, with, with, a, with another computer. Here where MRS steps in, you apply, you get approved and verified and everything. And then they provide you with everything else you need you know, to become successful and independent at your job site. Or same thing with school or, or, or like any other programs or certification process. So MRS steps in to support you through providing some accommodations that are needed to uh, help you and, you know, for you to become successful. So that's really in a nutshell. Great. And then I guess what's the difference between that and the assistive technology of Michigan? What do they offer? So um, that's the technology of Michigan, that's a very interesting part. And uh, as a blind person myself, I use different technology than you do, right? Mm -hmm. like now I'm using my iPad that talks. Right. My, com my computer talks. <laughs> my iPhone talks. Um, I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in my life, you know, every equipment in my life does talk, um, you know, especially the essential ones I'm talking. So as a blind person, our assistive technology is different than those um, of, you know, in a wheelchair or uh, that are deaf or hearing impaired or, you know, so the assistive, te the assistive uh, technology of Michigan, basically they, they step in and they help in providing uh, counsel and leadership and guidance. And they also provide some technology, some assistive technology equipments. And that's the overlapping part. But as a blind person myself, for example, through the Bureau of Service for, of, you know, for blind persons, Mm -hmm. You know, they are the primary source for any equipment, but whatever that they cannot provide, but hey, this is like, this did exceed our budget. We cannot provide this. That's that's where you have to tap into the MRS or the assistive oh, technology. Yeah. yeah, so that's why, again, I, I said, you know, we cannot separate the local county and the state organizations because every like they do fill the gaps, like they continue one another. Great, great. And somebody else just noted this, Beth. Um, thank you, Beth, in the comment, uh, comments in the chat. Uh, noted that, you know, uh, there's a one resource, the Special Education Mediation Services Program. Um, and this provides free meeting facilitation and mediation services for students with IEPs, birth to age 26, to help families and schools solve complex problems or resolve conflicts. So the website is uh, my kids, so M I, kidsfirst.org. Or the phone number 833 kids K I D S first one S T. Cool. Thanks for that, Beth. Uh, yeah, th th thank you, Beth. I, I mean, that's that's kind of the same thing what the Michigan Alliance for Families. Uh, you know, that's why I said you know they've become an advocate. Meaning, yes, they do. I should have explained that better. Sorry. So when I said advocate, meaning like if you have an IEP meeting and uh, you have some hard time, whether language barrier or what have you, especially in Dearborn, like we have a very diverse uh, communities. Um, and, and groups, um, you know, they, they can send somebody and they can help, you know, either to advocate to what your kid is not getting or just to, you know, help in like mediating, you know, what's going on so they can resolve the problem. So thank you, Beth, for that. Great. Um, and then we have a few more for the statewide, the Michigan Career yeah. and Technical Institute. Uh, that's a very important one. Um, employment, competitive employment it has been always uh, the top priority of mine, uh, local, state, and national. And uh, they do help in uh, career training, resume writing, uh, you know, 
Uh, we have, um, you know, like shadowing, uh, providing like internships and what have you. So it basically talks about how to pick the best career for you and how you get prepared to start on it. Great. Uh, and then the Area Agency on Aging Association. Awesome. Now, you might say that what does the AAA has to do uh, with this? A lot of our seniors uh, in Dearborn and statewide and even worldwide, a lot of them, they... Um, they tend to lose a sense, you know, um, among their senses, whether due to an accident, medical condition, or just, you know, from aging. Um, so that's why the AAA also provides many services, like, like transportation, community services, like food pantries, and uh, legal, legal, legal guidance. No, not necessarily that they have a lawyer that, uh, you know, they, uh, that they give you, but they do help in mitigating all these barriers and uh, help you to, um, to maneuver um, among all of these um, issues, so that's that's where that's where this is very important. Is for our senior citizens that have been blind, or those that become blind or disabled, so they can have you know somebody to uh, to uh, you know to help them when they need. Right, and I remember um, I worked at Legal Services for a while uh, early in my legal career. So at that point, you know, we would partner with the Area Agency on Aging. On aging. So it's something that you know sometimes certain legal services offices have uh, elder yeah. law attorneys uh, in their office. So sometimes that's a partnership where certain uh, services are able uh, to become more available to people who are older and then have you know certain disabilities, either mobility or other kind of issues that they're dealing sure. with. And sometimes the discrimination that happens, right, from either landlords or other, yes. other cases that are tied to both disability and age. So it's very important to think about. I, I appreciate the connection that you just made between, you know, why is this on the list? <laughs> I think it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, again, I mean, when I look at disability, um, not only because I'm blind myself, and I, again, I, I kind of broaden, you know, the, uh, you know, the the image, but also I, you have to make all connections that you need. So you know, because even like. Uh, discrimination or even abuse at the actual nursing homes. I mean, we've heard of many stories. Uh, we had heard many stories in the past that we do hear about it every day where uh, other people uh, get abused or whatever. I mean, unfortunate male, you know, treatment that they get, um, you know, and that's not acceptable. So that's why agencies such as the AAA, you know, is, is really great to, uh, you know, to tap into when we need yeah, uh, this next one, Regional Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA Center. Sure, uh, ADA is uh, a great law that protected uh, all Americans with disabilities uh, since uh, 30 years, uh, you know, to have as much as equal and accessible, um, you know, life as possible. You know, so if you are a student, again, you should be accommodated. If you apply for a job and you were not, uh, you know, granted the job because of your disability, that's a discrimination, which means that the law is gonna be standing there for you, or I mean, against you as an employer and gonna back you up as a victim. So uh, this is very important to for our parents, for our caregivers, for our, our disabled individuals themselves to be aware to um, what are their rights and uh, how they should be treated, how they should be addressed, you know, talked to, um, and what are, like, what are the expectations that they should, um, you know, like, like, like if they, if they go to school, what do, what do they should expect from their professor or, right. um, or admin? And then if they go to the work, to the workplace, what kind of services that their employer should be providing? And the answer is whatever that makes their, uh, job experience accessible and, uh, equitable. So as a blind person, I can't use a computer without a talking program. Having said that, the solution is very simple either use a MacBook that has a built-in talking program or purchase, or purchase a desktop and then upload something that we call JAWS that stands for Job Access with Speech and which makes everything. And then let's say if I go onto a website that is not accessible. Okay, we have to communicate with the IT department and with the website designers to make it accessible as much as possible. So that's the simple answer. You should be accommodated. It doesn't matter what your need is. It doesn't matter what your ability is. You should be accommodated no matter where you go. Um, you know, even buildings should be brailled, should have a ramp. Now, obviously all the newly built buildings, they have all this accommodation. Just wanna give people like different examples so, you know, they can relate to it in their real life. 
Yeah, and this is such a great point because the ADA is something that, you know, as you mentioned, 30 years ago. So it's not, and it's such a milestone victory. Uh, yeah. It provides, you know, and it goes back to what you mentioned at the beginning, which was the kind of uh, interaction between federal, state, and local kind of sure. agencies and things that are out there because the federal law provides a floor, right? This is like the bare minimum that people need to be um, working toward. And I think it's very important to, uh, around the ADA, these are rights that people have. They have a right to this. It's not something that somebody is doing out of, you know, the kindness of their hearts, right? Which is yeah. important, but at the same time, like this is a right. You have a right to have accommodations in your workplace. Um, so that way- I mean, I don't want people to think that they're asking for a privilege. Or, exactly. Yes, uh, being nice is awesome and being kind is awesome and is needed, but it shouldn't be only towards individual with disabilities. Who's going to refuse to be treated kindly, right? I mean, whether you're blind or not, disabled or not, are you going to refuse the fact that you're going to have a kind employer, a kind boss that is willing to help to make your job experience the best and so you can perform the best and therefore you know, make the best out of it. And that's on all levels. I mean, nobody is going to say no to that. So we don't want to make it sound that, oh, we're, we're making you a favor. No, as you said, exactly. Namira, that's, a, that's, that's, right. a, that's, that, that's the law. And uh, that should be, because nobody knows when they're going to become disabled, by the way. I mean, exactly. I always say, I always say we are one, one car accident, at least, you know, uh, may God protect everybody, of course, but we're always, uh, we're, we're always just one accident away from losing one of our senses. So who knows? Be kind so you can get it at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, and I know uh, Baba Baxter Jones out of Detroit, right? Like has talked about how people are either uh, currently disabled or temporarily abled because it's yeah. age, right? Things come up and- That's and why we mentioned things. aging because exactly. that's a very uh, crucial period of time where a lot of people have, you know, they lose their eyesight, their hearing, uh, they might fall down and, you know, and that's going to start them like a whole new- or maybe lose their memory or anything from that, you know, uh, nature. So, so we all have a vested interest, absolutely, yeah. in, in working absolutely. on on what are accommodations, what's available, what are people's rights, right, under the law um, sure. for these accommodations. And I wanted, especially, just to bring that up because when we think about the system of ableism, so many disabled people have internalized ableism. Like, I just need to power through it. You know, even though this is really difficult for me at work or I could really benefit from a different kind of chair or a different kind of equipment. Like, you know, I don't want to speak up because I don't want to, you know, cause trouble or- Or get fired or feel that I'm being extra burden. No, I mean, we do get this feeling sometimes. I'm not going to say no to that uh, because you feel like you're asking for so much. But again, um, I mean, in order to, um, you know, activate your full potential, you need everything that you can get uh, to do that. And, uh, and trust me, we are as much as valuable as, as everybody else. You know, and I think a lot of disabled people work, no offense, but they work way harder than, than, than a lot of non-disabled people because we appreciate opportunities and we make the best out of them. And I saw that firsthand through our students, uh, through the organization clients that we've been talking about. And, uh, and and through a lot of stuff. So we were, I mean, because it takes us a bit more to get things done. Exactly. You know, not because we are slower, but because we have different circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. Um, next up, Michigan Community Mental Health Services Program. Sure, so this is again for mental health. Again, they spread advocacy, awareness, and inclusion. And uh, they try to, you know, make sure that all their clients and whoever seek their help, uh, you know, is also uh, being accommodated properly. So I'm just going to put it that way. I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of your time <laughs> anymore. But that's really in a nutshell, like what they do. Um, it's just to make sure that, uh, you know, they uh, they are accommodating, uh, you know, their clients, um, you know, their the individual that call them, make sure that they are being uh, treated properly. And, you know, again, that's why you, you see a lot of mental health in these, because that's the number one challenge nowadays in the disabled community. And with that too, uh, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Yes, yes, exactly. So again, that's why you see a lot of these and why I mention all of these, because I don't know, I mean, some people might be familiar with one and not with the other. Um, you know, that's why I, I try to put in as much as organizations. And I'm sorry if I miss some, not because they don't contribute greatly to the, to the disabled community and to our lives in general, but uh, I mean, these these are the, the, the one that I've dealt with and that I see that they have uh, great impact, um, you know, uh, on the disabled community, local, state, and national uh, level as well. So same kind of thing, making sure that, you know, whoever they are serving, that they are being treated with integrity, respect, 
and they're you know fighting for inclusion, diversity, and equity. And so many of these organizations, I know that one, especially, you know, having hotlines for people who are either yes. directly impacted by you know, something or a caregiver or a family member or a friend, somebody who wants to call in for advice. They're, they're also available for that as well. Yes. Yeah, so, so all this mental health, uh, thank you for pointing that out. I wanted, I meant to mention that, uh, but I forgot. So thank you. <laughs> You're um, welcome. So I appreciate that. So yeah, so they have a lot of, uh, um, hotlines like nurse, um, substance abuse, uh, suicide, you know, for those who just like to talk and somebody, you know, just, they want somebody just to listen to them. So that's where you go. So that's why, again, these are very crucial because they can help you on the spot. Yes. And if you can save somebody's life by preventing them from committing suicide, that's a gift of life. And I, th I don't think the billions of dollars out there can, you know, uh, buy that, you know, so that's very important. Right. right. And it's especially important given how mental health sometimes resources, you know, you try to find a therapist, their waiting list might be three weeks out, four weeks out, five weeks out. So especially for this, I wanted to emphasize that as well. Just they have hotlines, please call, right? If you are in need of that kind of assistance. Sure. And if you have any problem finding the phone number, let me know. I'm more than happy to facilitate. Um, the Bureau for Services uh, or Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. Oh, yes. So uh, this is a BSBP. And again, if you are a student uh, in high school, for example, like throughout the K through 12, they follow up, but mainly the school district follows up with you as a blind student or low vision student. And then once you finish high school, that's your major uh, task, you know, dives in where they are willing to pay you the tuition that the financial aid FAFSA does not pay, uh, buy you some assistive technology equipments like computers with talking programs um, or magnifiers or laptops or braille computers, white canes. Um, and then they help you uh, to find a job um, after you graduate. So, you know, blind students or individuals, you know, uh, might find this very instrumental, especially with a tuition, um, you know, payment as well as the technology equipment because they're very expensive. That's a very important point. Like, like my my brother computer costs about six to six hundred dollars. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of my friends say, "Man, your computer is more expensive more expensive than my car." <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I I said, "Well, yeah. I mean, but it's very instrumental." So for exactly. everybody that needs the help, never hesitate. Do not hesitate to reach out to the BSBP for our blind and low vision uh, students and individuals, and for the newly blind people, they also help by. Uh, you know, sending you like to a vocational program where they show you how to, you know, cook while you're being blind, use the technology equipments, learn braille, mobility, like how to cross streets and use like the trains and buses and cabs and, you know, all these fun stuff that I went through myself, you know, from high school, um, you know, and that what makes me the person that I am today, the independent person that I am today. If I go to New York or Chicago or Alabama, or whatever, Hansville, Florida, Miami, wherever I go, I mean, you know, I don't feel like I'm, like I'm lost because right. again, these skills are embedded within me and uh, it's very important to, to do that. So that's, that's where this uh, really comes into. Okay, we're down to our last few. So the yeah. Brain Injury Association of Michigan. So the brain, the brain injury, again, we were talking about if you are totally um, physically talking like great and you don't have any disability, any any issues, any challenge, all of a sudden, let's say you get hit in the head or do a car accident and then you get a brain injury. Well, brain injuries might cause many disabilities and uh, and at least, you know, I mean, make up protect everybody like a long, like a lifelong I mean. uh, illnesses and pain and struggle. So this is um, help in mitigating all the barriers that the uh, individuals with brain injuries go through. And they do also, they have a possibility of helping like throughout the medical process and uh, building all that stuff because medical bills are one of the most expensive. And uh, yes, they, yes. yes or, yeah, <laughs> and, you, and, and you can relate to that. Um, but yeah, so organizations such as this might not be able to pay the whole thing, but I'm pretty sure that they can guide, um, you know, uh, individuals uh, to the right, to, you know, direction or appropriate resources. Um, and the next up is uh, Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service. Awesome. Sorry. And sure, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think, is this the same as MAPS? 
Is that is that right, or is it different? Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Michigan okay. Michigan Protection um, and Advocacy is actually it's the same, like almost like the Disability Network, uh, Wayne okay. County, Detroit. I mean, which is the next one. Um, yeah. You know the the numbers uh, twelve and thirteen, and they both provide advocates and advocacy training and how to stand up for yourself and your issues and and help in overcoming the obstacles and uh, and barriers. So, and that's the number one key. And the number one goal is to be an advocate, to be an influential advocate, to be a vocal advocate that uh, you're not only advocating just to advocate, but, you know, to advocate with 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 the great substance, you know, that you have a great content, a great substance and alternative solutions. And that's what we're going to touch on at the very end, you know, like how like how we're, we're like we're headed and and stuff like that. So these two are very important if you are in need for an advocate or if you'd like to become an advocate volunteer or maybe work for them if they are hiring uh, by advocating and fighting you know for equality inclusion and equity <laughs> um and then the wayne county mental health authority yeah so this is the, the wayne county mental health authority this is uh, a great uh, resource for mental health in wayne county obviously every county has their own uh so we didn't mean to exclude anybody but since dearborn is in wayne county and uh I'm trying to diversify the resources as much as I can, because again, a lot of these services, like I live in Dearborn, right? As a blind person, I will need to, I will need to be, re I will need to register with the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons in the state of Michigan, and then they refer me to my counselor in Detroit. And then let's say if you live in Grand Rapids or Kalamazoo, you know they have their own people over there. So uh, that's why we have this diversity of resources and locations. So this is a great one. Again, they help in advocacy, job uh, employment, uh, training for our mentally challenged individuals, and they have a huge budget. So it's not like any other center. It's, I mean, I'm not. I mean, I don't want to give like any wrong estimate, but they have <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars that they really manage, and uh, their work is beyond valuable and, and important. And same thing with the last, not least. I don't know. Have you heard of the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition? <laughs> I was about to say last but not least. Let's talk yeah. about the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Michigan Michigan Disability Rights um, Coalition is a great resource. And this is a big testament um, of what we're doing today, which I thank you guys once again for having me and everything. And for what we did uh, about a month ago when we had even more uh, challenged individuals um, on, the, on, the, on the conference. Uh, line and then for all the work and efforts and advocacy uh, that you guys do that uh, you know collectively aim to uh, you know spread awareness and you know fight for equity inclusion and uh, and, and, and and accessibility and uh, that's what we need today uh, we need um, all these great traits and uh, all the all these combined efforts to come together and uh, produce such great work. So we came a long way, um, you know, and the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition is, doesn't need like anybody to, to define its mission and vision, to be honest with you. I'm not saying that to your face by any means, but, um, you know, I mean, it lines up greatly with all the, uh, you know, uh, if I may call them, you know, the great values that, you know, uh, that what the word rights stand for. Yeah, that's called Michigan Disability Right Coalition. I like that name. I mean, alone, you know, it's for Michigan, it's for the rights of the disabled people, and it's a coalition. So that's what we need: teamwork. And teamwork makes you work. So. Perfect. So, like we mentioned, you know, last but not least, there are so many other resources as well. Yes. But you know, if you have anything else that we have not spoken about, we went through. I think fifteen today. Yes, fifteen today. Um, yeah, so if you have any other ones that we have mentioned, I mean, obviously, 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 there are many of others. Again, we're sorry. I didn't mean to exclude anybody um, right. by any mean, but uh, I mean, from a personal, humble experience, and from like the impact that they make on the state, local, national level. I mean, these these organizations contribute greatly. And if anybody has any other you know, suggestions, ideas, or resources, uh, by any means, I mean, send them over. Yes. So it's 15 statewide and then seven of the uh, disability resources in Dearborn. Yes. Um, so in this last, like, we have about 15 minutes left. So I wanted to just, you know, pivot to this conversation around both, like, you know, barriers and challenges around this, but also accomplishments and successes. And then we can talk about, you know, the future of this work and where we're going next. 
Yes. So the barriers and challenges um, are the reason behind the accomplishments and successes. If you don't go through some hard time, you're not going to experience good time. And uh, if you're not going to go through a hardship, you're not going to enjoy the taste and the meaning of success, stability, and prosperity. So we came a long way. Um, all the organizations, why they were founded. I mean, they were founded on the premise of fighting for what is it right, ethical, moral, equal, honorable, noble, and the list goes on and on and on. So um, having said that, when we are seeing the unemployment rate among the disabled community, statewide, Dearborn wide, national wide is dropping. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, national wide, we've had 78% of our disabled population are unemployed. Now we are down like maybe to 63, I think that was the last one that I saw uh, from a year or so, um, you know, so that's a 15% improvement. That's great in the past two years. Um, and when we talk about unemployment, doesn't mean that there are no job opportunities only. Doesn't mean that there is not such what we call unrecognized discrimination only. But also, uh, you know, we need to make sure that our individuals that are, you know, disabled are also ready, prepared, motivated, uh, you know, to make a difference and get engaged and become an active member of their social, political, economic, and, you know, uh, overall life fabric. Um, so that's a major uh, challenge was the unemployment and the success or accomplishment is the employment. Uh, we've got education. We've got a lot of students, a lot of individuals, they are going to schools and not only uh, high school or even undergrad, but also now we're going masters and doctorates and uh, becoming professionals. So that's an, that was another challenge where how we can integrate, um, you know, and include the individual with disabilities to the public school system, uh, whether K through 12 or even college. And now they are all over the place. And not only now that they are going through English literature or psychology, uh, I mean, I'm so thrilled uh, to see that they're going through civil engineering, political science, law, uh, you know, and uh, even mechanical engineering, nuclear, uh, you know, uh, uh, science, which sounds very tough, right? Um, so, yeah, I know. Um, so, so, we, so that's that was a big challenge. I mean, to get them into school first thing first, and then now they are in schools and they are acquiring and pursuing very high degrees, and not only that, with very uh, complicated. Uh, majors and they're making great difference. I mean, we, we just saw uh, that student deaf and blind uh, Harvard graduate. I mean, what a great accomplishment. And we need to see that every day. Um, we, um, you know, we have a lot of local business owners that are disabled, um, you know, also, especially when it comes to technology, because again, that's the key. Uh, with today's technology, I mean, the good thing about it is that we as blind and you know, or disabled people, uh, we are able to access a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I cannot do this virtual uh, meeting today if it wasn't for accessible and assistive technology. Right. So, um, so that's another huge thing where a lot of the websites, uh, technology equipment, cell phones, uh, computers, cars, even, you know, uh, even public accommodations, hospitals, you know, they're all accommodated now with a lot of technology equipments that are enabling everybody uh, you know, to access uh, life like everybody else. So overall, the challenges are inclusion, which it's not going to end. You know, I mean, it's not going to end. Uh, we need to fight more for inclusion. We need to make sure that everybody is included. Uh, we need to maintain these successes and accomplishments and even work harder to accomplish more. Uh, you know, they always say it's great to reach an A+, plus, but the harder part is how to maintain the A+, plus, right? So we're not A plus yet, but certainly we came a long way and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will even accomplish more stuff um, in the near future. And that's really what takes to the last point. I know that you're sick of my voice. No, no, I was just gonna comment that, you know, I love that point, especially looking at the pandemic, 
it's yeah. such a, a perfect example of how challenges can also lead to successes. So it's like before the pandemic hit, there were so many opportunities that people were like, we can't provide accessible, you know, alternate uh, taking exactly. a We can't do it. You have to come in person. So if you don't have the money, if you don't have, you know, the ability to get to a plane, if there's not accommodations to be physically traveling, you just can't attend. And that's been such a barrier for people with different kinds of disabilities in the past. Sure. And then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden, oh yeah, you can work from home, right? <laughs> Can't attend virtually yeah sure. and so this whole and, uh, concept of like yeah. things opening and up right now with the pandemic it's showing how certain things can be made accessible we need to make absolutely and you now everybody has to work from home um everybody has to do their stuff uh virtually so now even the inaccessible uh websites have to be accessible and uh, that's again that's why i mentioned above among the challenges is technology and not only having the right equipments, but also if I have the computer, but I don't have the accessible website, how I can access it. So that is certainly a great point that you mentioned. So yeah, see, that's that's the only positive thing about it. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. about, 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 about the COVID, you know, I mean, that's the only positive thing is that now people realize two things, the importance of technology and the importance of accessible technology, how, how accessible it is and how it's very important to ensure that everybody is having access to um, to 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 to, uh, to inclusive and friendly uh, user technology. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's just going to show, right? Like there are things that we imagine doing things differently. Sometimes, right now, we had to do it, but in the future, you know, inshallah, I really hope that people take that to heart. That these sure. are things that we can vision differently. We can imagine different worlds. So, on that note, I'd love to give it to you. Uh, you know, the final kind of word around looking toward the future. Sure, no problem. I appreciate that. And and see, we've talked about the importance of advocacy. We've talked about great organizations, um, and I'm pretty sure that there are so many still out there that they do also a great job uh, when it comes to advocacy and fighting for inclusion, diversity, equality, equity, and all that stuff. Um, but now, what is the future? I mentioned towards the beginning of this session that it's it's great to be advocate. It's great to be. Uh, an educator. It's great to stand up and say, hey, we are here and we need this to be accessible and we need that to be, uh, you know, uh, in accordance with the ADA and all that stuff. But then if we really think about it, we have to shift our attention and our focus and we should heavily work to not, you know, nominate or encourage individuals with disabilities, you know, from all disabilities to run for offices, city council, school board, mayor, state rep, state senate, congress, u.s. senate, president, vice president, why not? It's not really for the show, it's not really for the empathy, it's not for the, uh, you know, like, yeah, for the highlight, you know, and for people to call you an inspiration. Um, it's, it's really because we, nobody can tell our stories better than we can do. You know, it doesn't matter what your disability is. As a blind person, as a person that with a wheelchair, uh, or I'm sorry, in a wheelchair, um, you know, hearing impaired, learning disabled, I mean, nobody's going to be able to tell your story and talk about your challenges. Nobody's going to know how to overcome these challenges uh, more than you can do. So now it's a time to actually have a seat at the table. It's a time to uh, at least, you know, start doing that. I do hear of uh, many officials nationwide that they either made it to the Congress or they are currently in Congress. Uh, you know, I know our Supreme Court Justice here, Richard Bernstein, is is amongst also uh, our, our, our challenge individuals he's blind and yet he he's on the supreme court justice uh, i'm sorry supreme court here in the state of michigan um you know and myself just as a humble example i ran and i didn't trust me uh people are not going to vote for you if you don't if they don't see something potential like you know like important or something that you know brings hope you know um earning 12,263 votes and losing just by 15 votes waiting not waiting the recount you know, um, doesn't mean that, you know, it's not that people voted for me just because they wanted, you know, like they were bored and and um, and they just thought about, you know, bubbling my name just to make me feel good. No, not at all. I didn't win the seat. Yes, that's correct. It's a loss, whether by one vote or 1,000 votes. But to get that close with incumbent, with an incumbent, which I have the full respect and I appreciate her and she knows that. So nothing personal by any mean. But uh, you know, but to come that close and uh, to earn that much votes in such very exceptional circumstances in the midst of the pandemic, um, you know, that means that the message has been delivered 
and people are motivated and they're not going to forget it. But now what I got to do on a personal level, and that's going to take me the last minute um, of, of, of this session, is I'm going to, I'm not going to stop here. I certainly, I'm not running for a title or position. I'm running to make a difference and to make sure that everybody is included in the conversations that are made uh, in our schools, city, state, and national levels. Um, so I'm not going to stop here. And I, I kindly encourage everybody to get into public policy, to get into political science, to get into law, uh, to run for offices, to encourage people to run for office. Be vocal, at least. If you don't want to run for office, be vocal. Stand up for what is right. Uh, don't, don't, don't get scared of, of, of being, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, as long as we approach it in a very polite and respectful manner, uh, but never, never back down from a, from from a great fight, because the better that we can get, the better I'm gonna live, the better you're gonna live, and our kids and our, everybody else. So, it's not making anybody a favor. It's really about ensuring an accessible a, an accessible and equal life for all, and that's by being on the table. I'm sorry, not on the table, at the table. You know, because a lot of people think it's a sink on the table. We're being <laughs> at the, yeah, being at the table and not no longer on the menu. You know, so we don't want we don't want people to make decisions on our behalf. We don't be, we don't want people to just think or assume that yeah, this is gonna make them happy or sad. We want to be there. We want to be a major part of the decision making, and we want to make sure that we are well presented. Because nobody again can narrate our stories better than we can do it. And I really wish everybody the best. And and if I have if you have any final questions or comments, I'd be more than happy to to answer. But it's been a great session. Thank you so much. And especially on that note, yeah, this is you know creating a different world for all of us. And I encourage everybody who tuned in today live and who's gonna be watching this later as well. You know, if if the list is overwhelming of who to reach out to, reach out to one, right? If you don't know exactly what you want to do to encourage and, and create a different world, pick one action, right? Um, whether that's what's writing op-eds or contacting your elected representatives or running for office, um, getting involved with local organizations, right? Creating new media and narratives and storytelling. All of these things are so, so important. And there's always something that every single person has a talent for, has capacity um, you know, to, to change something right, um, in the world for all of us. And so I think it's very important to just, if all of it seems overwhelming, to pick one thing. Um, and I hope that this session has given you some opportunities for that. Um, again, thank you to Khudr. Thank you to uh, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. <laughs> Uh, to all of you for tuning in, for the comments and everything. We really appreciate it. Um, and we are all set, ending right on time. So I appreciate it. Have an amazing rest of your weekend. And um, we'll see Happy you all next time. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you all Thank next you, time. Uh, Thank Shala. you. Thanks so much. Take care, all. Bye-bye. Peace. Mm -hmm.